This big, brown, flat, mysterious, crazy country, it's Martin Malloy with Mick Malloy and Tony Martin. And today are the nation's leading comedians and impressionists about to be put out of business by Queensland gun nut Ian McNiven and his eerie John Howard. We'll find out. Also today, the latest on Australia's fat-reducing wonder drug, Robbie Coltrane's follow-up to Cracker and an exclusive chat with the man who proved the the cynics wrong Russian President Boris Yeltsin. For one final time this week, we'll play Beat the Beasley and Radio Gladiators. We'll dish out the Fumio and wrap up the week in fine style with comedian Steve Bedwell. Yes, it's all coming up on the program where stupidity is the big winner, Martin Malloy. On this week anyway, with myself, Tony Martin and this bloke here, a man who's earning a bit of extra cash these days, writing material for both Tim Fisher and Ian McNiven. Mick Malloy. <laughs> I don't know where to go next. I think I've peaked too early. Well, I hope not, because as uh, as people in here can see, we've got the monkey suits on, mm -hmm. because it's Friday, and as always, time for the pomp and pageantry of the Fumio. A little ceremony which occurs every week about this time, where we celebrate the achievements and honour the bravery of the individual whose behaviour has supplied us with the most material over the last week. And just like with the Russian elections, alcoholism, incompetence and even death are no handicap and indeed may well give the nominees, well, an extra leg up in the mm. final go round. Mick, who's made the final cut? Greg Norman who lost a golf tournament for having incorrectly marked balls. This is a departure for Norman, who usually loses by displaying no balls at all. Oh Ian McNiven, his name had to come up. The Queensland pro-gun extremist who's moved into the entertainment business via an extraordinary impression of the Prime Minister has been so successful he's changing his name to David McNiven and releasing two best-selling autobiographies, Bring On the Empty-Headed Gun Nuts and The Moon's a Balloon, so let's blast the crap out of it. <laughs> Nelson the Dog who escaped from a Qantas flight and had to be had to be chased around the airstrip. The incident caused some flights to be delayed for up to one hour, or, as a Qantas spokesman put it, seven doggy hours. <laughs> Cliff Richard, whose willingness to launch into a medley of his hits whenever torrential rain strikes finally gives uh, drought-stricken Australian farmers something to feel lucky about. But no, by a surprising majority, the Fumio goes to Boris Yeltsin. Yes, the Russian president who says he still wears the pants in that country and his stunning 54% majority is the proof, which is quite a coincidence because, as we know, Mr Yeltsin is himself 54% proof. <laughs> <laughs> and Tone, we've got him on the line now. Mr Yeltsin, can you hear me? Yes, Mick. Loud and clear. Congratulations on your election win. You must be celebrating. What election? Oh, uh, you bloody oath. Why not join me in a victory toast? Uh, Mr Yeltsin? <laughs> Mr Yeltsin? Oh dear. Well, uh, while we're here, Mickey, I mm -hmm. might just mention uh, Steve Bedwell's coming in. And Excellent. Yeah. Always enjoy a bit of a visit from Steve. Yep. And uh, Beat the Bees Link, we'll be having that. What are we dropping today? Uh, oh, don't give too much away. Oh, no, definitely not. <sighs> did I mention Steve Bedwell? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think you did. Okay. Mm. Any uh, plans for the weekend, Tone? Thought I might pop round to Ian McNiven's place. Oh, yeah. Fancy dress, you know. Mm -hmm. Get a bit of material for next week's show. Could you get my jodhpurs back? Oh, sure. I'll just... Mm -hmm. <sighs> Mr. Yeltsin? <sighs> Bartender, I said the double. Uh, Mr. Ye hang on, hang on. <sighs> <sighs> Well, that must have put a spring in your step. Yes, yes. In fact, I, I think I'm getting happy feet. Oh, 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 dear. Oh, help. Somebody stop this madness now. 
of you simple minds, don't you forget about me here at Martin Malloy. And Mick, I've been reading more about fat drug testing. Mm. As you were saying on yesterday's show, uh, Australian scientists are on the verge of a world breakthrough in combating obesity mm. with a new wonder drug. Actually, I think uh, Eddie Murphy may have beaten them to it if you've seen the shorts <laughs> for the nutty professor. Yep. Have you seen the shorts for this nutty professor? I have, indeed. It's yep. a huge monster hit. Mm. And uh, it's Eddie Murphy. And it's a remake of the old Jerry Lewis yep. Nutty Professor. Mm -hmm. Except that if you remember in that one, which is on uh, every Saturday afternoon, <laughs> as far as I can tell, um, he's nutty. He's nutty. He's real nutty. Mm. He's got nutty teeth. Mm. He's got a nutty haircut. He's mm. got a nutty walk. He's got a nutty voice. Yep. He drinks the magic potion, and then he's Buddy Love. <laughs> Smooth bloke. Now, this one, it's just a real fat guy who turns in. Shouldn't it be the fatty professor? <laughs> fatty professor. There's nothing nutty about him as no. far as I can see from the shorts. No. He's, it should just be the fat professor. <laughs> but anyway, I'm sure they know what they're doing. And I'll tell you who'd be feeling like a bit of a dick, and uh, that's uh, David Caruso. This right. man can't put a foot right. He's left uh, NYPD Blue, mm -hmm. hasn't won the Emmy, made mm -hmm. a bit of a goog of himself mm -hmm. there. He's made two flop movies in a yep. row. And then guess what he's done? He's signed up for the new Eddie Murphy film, yeah. which is a cop movie called Metro, yeah. and of course Eddie hasn't had a hit for a while, yeah. and out comes Vampire in Brooklyn, massive flop, Caruso's gone, oh, I can't get associated with this bloke, I'm pulling out, I'll go and make some little art film instead, and then of course the nutty professors come out and made 25 million bucks in the first hour, <laughs> and this is what I reckon you'd be hearing round at David Caruso's place, go, 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 that's all you get on the answering machine if you're calling him up. But uh, getting back to Australia's fat-destroying wonder drug, which uh, at this stage the Melbourne research team is simply calling AOD 9401. <laughs> oh, dear. Come on, guys, you'll have to do better than that. Nobody's going to be racing down the chemists for something called AOD 9401. You need a name like... Fat be gone. Lard away. No more blubber. Or if it's a device of some sort, they always call it something violent, yeah. don't they? It's, uh, you know, the gut buster or the thigh slapper or the ass blaster 2000. <laughs> you got yourself an ass blaster 2000? Oh, don't go anywhere without it, Tom. <laughs> but it's going to be quite a while before it's in the shops anyway because, as you reported, they've tested it successfully on mice and rats. Mm. The next step is to try it out on sheep and pigs. Mm. And what, if they can produce some sort of waif look porker, <laughs> they'll then move on to cows and then humans. Uh. Gee, there's a real pecking order when it comes to testing new drugs, isn't it? <laughs> yep. Rats and mice, they can get caught up for anything. Mm. They're down the back in economy. Uh, your pigs and sheep, they're in business. Yeah. Stuff only comes to them once it's checked out with the rats and mice mm. first. Yep. Uh, then up in first class, you've got your cows. <laughs> and they get the stuff off the top shelf, the really good vaccines, uh. and it's always served hot and on proper crockery. But imagine the conversations if you're in the middle, if you're a sheep or yeah. pig. Heard about this uh, new whooping cough vaccine? Oh, didn't make it past the rats. I was awake all night thanks to those bloody coughing mice. <laughs> what about the uh, new fat-reducing uh, wonder drug? Heard anything? Yeah, yeah, I've seen a lot of very slim ferrets in the last week. I imagine they'll be slipping that in our food any day now. Get ready to have your pants taken in. That's my advice. Right, right. Any word on this new anti-impotence solution? Yeah, I think it must be the good stuff. They've bypassed us completely. I've seen a lot of very embarrassed-looking cows walking around the lab in a sort of half-crouch. <laughs> Tina Arena here at Martin Malloy. This week on Martin Malloy, Robbie Coltrane is cake shop owner. Hi, uh, I'd like one of those uh, vanilla slices in the window. Oh, I'm sure you would. Sorry? You've had your eyes on it for quite a while, haven't you? <laughs> Look, I was... I was just... Every day you walk past this shop and see it sitting there on the shelf looking up at you, mocking you <sighs> with its tight little crumbly biscuit base and its delicious vanilla body, and it's looking at you, nobody but you, and it's saying, you're nothing, you'll never be anything, and it makes you feel cheap. This is... And you want to get at it, don't you? Show it who's boss. You want to grab that vanilla flavoured pastry and give it a lesson it'll never forget, don't you? No, I... Don't be afraid to talk about it. Now's your chance. It may be the only chance you'll get. I just want... Won't. Of course you do. Don't worry, I understand. I've been there. But once you've had that vanilla slice, that won't be the end of it. Oh, no. You'll have to find another and eat again in a desperate attempt to slake your lust. For that's what it is. A name 
nameless craving for confectionery, pure, clean, unspoiled confectionery, sitting there looking up at you saying, come on, big boy, eat me, eat me. Listen, listen. Eat this... me, come on, treat me rough, I'm asking for it. But it's a cry for help, isn't it? Because deep down, you know that that vanilla slice is just like you. Dirty, disgusting filth, not fit to walk on God's earth. Well, here's two dollars, just oh. give me... Oh, so you don't mind paying for it? Interesting. Does your wife know you live your life this, this way? This has nothing to do oh, with... Of course it doesn't. I'm sure she makes a lovely vanilla slice, but no, you'd much rather slink down here for a bit of the rough stuff. Right, that's it. Did your mother make your vanilla slice? <sighs> what are you talking Oh, now it's starting to add up. Did she make your lamingtons? Did she tell you that if you're a good little boy, you'd get a nice bit of blueberry pie? Blueberry... Aye. I like the pie in this picture. Look at it. Look at it. It. Unfinished, mutilated, and here's another one, and another. Is that ringing any bells? You sort make me sick, but you know what? Right now, I'm the only friend you've got. <laughs> That's it. Get it out of your system. Oh, go on, think of me as a giant pavlova. <laughs> That's it. Not the cream out of me. I'm asking for an anti- <laughs> Robbie Coltrane, cake shop owner. Coming soon. <laughs> You'll be back! You'll be back! Fast love, that's George Michael here at Martin Malloy, where in the next hour, Steve Bedwell's on board. He'll be helping us wrap up the week. Mm. We just sit back in the comfy chairs and mm. Steve does all the hard work. That's how that... Uh, I've unfold. been on the night in some of Steve's segments. <laughs> Have you? No, not, not because they're not bloody entertaining, no. but uh, just because it's a chance to put the feet up. That's right, that's right. It's just a big three-position comfort session for us uh, <laughs> for that half hour. But also, we've got Beat the Beasley uh, coming up, and yesterday we successfully brained Cliff Richard with a homemade Beasley constructed for us by Adelaide aviating genius, Mr. Uh, jo John Johansson. John Johansson. That's right, the man I keep calling Jake. Uh, that's in the next hour. We'll be doing something even more spectacular uh, with uh, an effigy of... Can we say anything at all? Let's just say Boris Yeltsin's involved. <laughs> That'll all, get him listening. That's all you need to know, people. And Radio Gladiator is coming up, but uh, everyone around the office today is talking... Ian McNiven. Now, do people know who Ian McNiven is, Mickey? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I think they do. Did you uh, catch his work uh, addressing that gun rally in Gympie? Right, yeah, yeah, I, I did. did. I switched on the telly to see a fully grown man in the full Nazi regalia doing the most piss-weak John Howard impression I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> in, in fact, I shouldn't refer to him as Ian McNiven because he <laughs> was in character as sawn off little dickhead Jackboot Johnny. And that's his own title. That's his own title. He made that up all by himself. Did you see him in the get-up tone? He was wearing a black uniform <laughs> with a red tie, swastika armbands, and, well, how would you describe his footwear? <laughs> well, it, uh, it's gumboots. <laughs> it's gumboots. Oh, I've got a photo here, and it's definitely gumboots. I thought it was uh, Jackboot Johnny, not gumboot Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Sort off little dickhead. Gumboot Johnny. Gumboots. Well, probably appropriate. I mean, who could ever forget the way the Nazis marched through Germany in the old gumboots? <laughs> Remember all that footage of Cliffy Young running around the paddock in a pair of gumbies? <laughs> I reckon he must have been on the run from those Nazi hunters <laughs> who were trying to track him down and prosecute him for war crimes. <laughs> now, look, for those of you who haven't seen the footage, McNiven employed all his chameleon-like skills <laughs> to take on the persona of Jackboot Johnny and basically just swaggered around the stage, delivered Nazi salutes and denigrated John Howard in front of about 120 people, some of whom walked out in disgust when he refused continued requests to do his Greek fruit or a character. <laughs> wouldn't do it. No, just wouldn't do it. Had a quick go at that poofy bloke from Are You Being Served? You know, the old, I'm free! But no, nah, wouldn't, wouldn't do the Greek fruit. Could he uh, muster up a Frank Spencer? <laughs> <laughs> he did a quick betty. How that would, would uh, Ian McNiven go on red faces, do you think? <laughs> oh, well, it's funny you should say that, Tone, because oh, really? when I turned on the telly, I was actually expecting to see a bit of news, but it actually looked like I'd come in on one of those best and worst of red oh, faces. Dear. I'm looking at it for a couple of minutes, watching, and I'm thinking, geez. Why isn't red gone dim? <laughs> Jeez, black is as quiet tonight, isn't he? But uh, no, it didn't happen. If, if one of those blokes from Hale and Pace ever gets sick, McNiven could, could just get that big break he's been looking for. Tone, I've actually been uh, working on an impersonation of my own. Yeah. Uh, it's of Ian McNiven. Of Ian McNiven. Of Ian McNiven himself. Would you like to be part of it? Yeah, how do I do that? Uh, uh, well, for a start, you've just got to get in this giant pantomime ass costume okay. with me. Uh, sure, be happy to, Mickey. Now, do you want to be the left buttock or the right? I'll take the left. Okie dokie. Oh, 
Okay, right. Are you in? Yeah. Okay, on the count of three. Right. One, two, three. <laughs> delinquents. They smell bad. They use foul language. They've already wrecked our party. Now you've got to get them out of here right now. Welcome back to Martin Malloy where yes, it's your opportunity to come down to our level. Radio Gladiators, your chance to represent your state and win fame, glory and fabulous prizes. Here's today's challenge. Mick, we've had a few faxes mm. and calls and requests to do one we did last week, mm -hmm. and that is we were talking about that book. Um, what is it? Men are from Venus. Women are from Pluto. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I think that was it. Oh, I think at least one word is correct yep. in that uh, title. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's the book uh, by, I think, a man called John Gray, where he talks about uh, differences between men and women. Not the mm -hmm. obvious ones, mm -hmm. the more subtle mm -hmm. behavioural ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about this last week, and yep. people are saying, why not do that again, because I want to have a crack at it. We've been inundated yeah. with requests. Now, I've been keeping an eye out for them, and here's one that happened to me on the weekend. Yep. As you know, we've got the big Martin Malloy website up and running, so yep. I thought it's time for me to dive in and mm -hmm. find out what the internet's all about. So we've gone around to a friend's place who's got it wired up. And uh, when you watch uh, your girlfriend get on the internet, it's quite mm. different from what uh, the bloke might do because uh, she's on there looking up uh, sensible things. You know, mm. the search. You get on the mm. net search engine, mm. whatever it is, and you go, oh, I want to find something about, uh, I don't know, interesting stuff, mm. music, mm. films. Mm. Mm. And I'm just putting rude words into it. <laughs> it's like an advanced version of looking through the dictionary when you're 10 right? years old looking for farts. <laughs> it's like that. I was just putting in any old rude word I could come up with. Uh, and I thought, there's a subtle difference between you men and women. <laughs> yeah. I, I like it a lot. Here's one, mm. and here's one that a few people will, uh, would probably be aware of. But, uh, he, well, I, I consider this to be a difference. You won't get a bloke who's turning up to a party yeah. cracking a spaz yeah. because another bloke of that party is wearing exactly the oh, same no. outfit. No. <laughs> and that's just women, isn't it? <laughs> because if a woman walks in and someone's wearing the exact same dress... Get yourself out of there yeah. quick as you can. Oh, it's like you are not going to hear the end of it. No, it's like Twister, isn't it? All of a sudden, the whole room's in turmoil. Oi, oi, oi. Blokes don't do that. No. You know, you see another bloke on the other side of the room wearing a pair of acid wash jeans <laughs> and a kind of foolish off-duty cop kind of shirt. <laughs> and you go, oh, that's all right. I don't feel threatened at all. It's cause for celebration. There you go. That's right. Hey, Davo. Yeah, I'm North. blending in. Nice selection. The old number 4B. Well done. <laughs> and uh, here's, a, here's another one. Uh, uh, women and men tend to watch uh, Beavis and Butthead differently. I do that. Well, well in, at my house they do. Mm -hmm. uh, the man, that'd be me, mm -hmm. uh, giggling like a schoolgirl. <laughs> uh, the woman uh, grabbing the TV weak. <laughs> <laughs> Gra grabbing the remote. You're supposed to be some kind of sophisticated humorist, aren't you? Because <laughs> <laughs> here's something else I've noticed. The size of armpit stones. Oh, really? No, and the women get down pit stones, just like men, but they're always about the size of a 20-cent piece. Yeah. Whereas your bloke, Go the, he's uh, got that coming right down the side of his... Looks like he's got a two-tone shirt on. Yeah. It looks, looks like it's just... It's aping right down to his hips. It's like that big shadow that's going over Washington in the trailer for <laughs> Independence Day. <laughs> it's just there on it the is. spread. It's on the move. <laughs> Pavarotti style. Mm. And, of course, uh, our producer, Gracie, was pointing out, uh, you know, shopping. Obviously, mm. making a shopping list can be different mm. uh, because when I get out the shopping list, it's mm. snack foods at the top. Mm. All that other, uh, you know, important stuff, um, mm. just committed to memory, basically. <laughs> CC's, Tim Tams, important gear. You've got it covered. Now, uh, somebody has sent us a fabulous fax. I'll name him. He is, in fact, Andy Jager, who's the training specialist at Hewlett Packard, and he employs this kind of stuff at work. Does he's he? he's uh, running seminars. I don't know if he really is or whether this is a gag thing, <laughs> but let's assume that he's bona fide. And he's got seminars for men. Uh, the topics, well, of course, it always starts with the remote. The remote control overcoming your dependency. Uh, real men ask for directions. 
Uh, parenting, no, it doesn't end with conception. How to fill an ice cube tray. We do not want sleazy under things for Christmas. Give us money. And uh, one of his more popular ones, uh, honest, you don't look like Mel Gibson, especially when naked. And he's running seminars for women. Let's see what he's got for the uh, for the ladies. He's got uh, the remote control. Don't touch what you can't handle. Uh, he's got uh, avoiding walking in front of the TV. Most of the, uh, <laughs> the they seem to send around the telly these oh, seminars. Yeah. And, of course, learning to choose what to wear in less than four hours. So it's a bit generalised, mm, but that's mm. what we're chasing, isn't that's it? That's what we want. All right, and what have we got for the listeners? What incentive do we have? Step into the prize lounge, if you will, for a moment. As I inform you, we have tickets for you and a friend to see John Farnham live in concert. We've got a Martin Malloy T-shirt. It's unisex. Plus, you'll go into the drawer for that trip for two, staying at the fabulous four-star Port Douglas treetops. Uh, you're in the safe hands of Dougie T himself, you're flying Ansett Airlines, you're staying seven nights, and guess what? We're drawing it in about, oh, 15 minutes yes. at the conclusion of this segment. Call us up with your subtle behavioural differences between men and women, 1-800-657-657. Clean Dion, because you love me here at Martin Malloy, it's Radio Gladiators, and today, once again, we're talking about the subtle behavioural differences between women and men. There's mm. one right there. I expect our women much more keen to go and see the film, what that does. Uh, song comes from which is oh, i don't know <laughs> well there you go it's we rest the, our case oh, i don't know what it is we've talked about this before it's the one with uh michelle pfeiffer running around with her granddad <laughs> <laughs> up close and craggy yeah i think that's it <laughs> all right let's uh, maybe introduce the listeners who's got something to say today mickey uh young man named anthony i'd like to kick things off g'day anthony how are you yeah good how are you nah, not too bad now you'd be an observationalist <laughs> from way back uh, in your travels what have you come across in the Women? way of a subtle difference between well, Men and women. Women's love of junk mail. Oh, they thrive on it, and yeah. I hate it. Oh, I see. And what do Look, you do what, with, with the junk mail yourself, Anthony? Straighten the bin? Does it even make it to the front door? Look, well, if there's a lick of land or something like that with a beer special, <laughs> oh, well, it's got to be put in its place. <laughs> oh, but, well, that's, you, you read that from cover to cover, don't you? Yeah, that's literature. <laughs> that's on the bestseller list. the wear ads you've got. Uh, that's price a rump steak. Yeah. Yeah. What sort of life do you have to lead to be interested in oh, it? Oh, well, you I know. What I sort know. of oxygen safety do you have to be? I know a lot of men who are pretty keen to check if the uh, bra shop catalogue's in there. Mm. Yeah, but you, you know. get that out before your missus sees. Yeah, I see. You put it under the, you know, well, secret Well, some spot. people have them in binders, you know, like those week-by-week <laughs> week kind of deals. But, You've been to my place. And, uh, Anthony, do you go the uh, no junk mail please sign? Well, the... we, we haven't put it up yet. How Naturally, useless is that sign? My wife just loves it. It's just... Uh, it's this just... is the most ignored piece of literature <laughs> ever penned. If you're delivering uh, junk mail and you see no junk mail, please, that mm. means seven or eight will go in there <laughs> if I stay here long enough with a stick. Okay, thanks, Anthony. There's uh, a good one to mm. kick off with. Mm -hmm. uh, who's next? Uh, it's a young lady named Margaret. Hello, Margaret. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? What have you noted? What's the diff? Well, women do not sit on the edge of the bed cross-legged and bite their toenails off. Oh, really? Mm. And men do? Yes, they certainly do. <laughs> Round at your place, hang on, bite their toenails off. Are you married to a contortionist or...? No, not married to one, but my brother is, certainly. Oh. It's disgusting. Your brother is married to a no, bloke who sits on the end of the bed and it. bites his toenails off. <laughs> he bites his toenails? Have you ever tried this? I'm very keen yeah, to... Yes, I have, Tone, but I want to stress it was on top of the doona, <laughs> not under. Under the doona, that's going too far. But on top, hey, go for your life. And you don't swallow them, of course. That's what you draw the <laughs> not line. Not at all. All right, not Margaret. All. You, you go to spit. <laughs> all right, thanks, Margaret. That's a beauty. And now we've got Cliff. Cliff, what is your subtle difference? Between... G'day, guys. What do you got for us, Cliff? Well, listen, mate, I, I want to talk about the correlation between women's clothes and uh, mirrors. Oh, yes. Well, you know, you go, we get in front of the mirror, come here, get dressed and walk away. Ready to go. Yeah. No, well, uh, <laughs> no, it's not my wife. She turns what mirror she's at. Yeah. You know, and oh boy, it's like one of those chips. You know, the bathroom one's all right, yeah. but the bedroom one, mate, it's as if you're looking at one of those circus mirrors. You know, she <laughs> goes off. I have that yeah. too. The old fun park mirror. Oh, mate, like, are so... you seeing something I'm not seeing? Well, that's looking that's fine right. to me. Yeah. The but... problem is, I try. I say something nice, and I, you know, it's the wrong thing to do. Oh, yes. If I don't say anything at all, it's the wrong thing. I can't win, mate. But I'm sure all that behaviour is intended for your benefit, Cliffy. Um, well, I guess it must be. I haven't quite worked out how, though. <laughs> okay, well, that's that's uh, that's one. Okay, we've come across that a few times. But uh, what's Gail got to tell us about? Gail? Yeah, hi. <laughs> I found that men seem to be more woozy, more wimpy when they get hurt. 
Oh, okay. Yes. Tell us about a recent example that's happened to you, Gail. I have actually, yeah. My husband, he um, sprained his ankle a little bit, taking out some compost. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, oh, my ankle, it's really sore. I've got to go and see the doctor. So he trots off to the doctor, and the doctor is a man too. Yeah. Tells him, oh, you must keep it warm and wrapped up, and you must keep it elevated and don't get on it all day and, right. you know, not to stand on it or anything. <laughs> Whereas, for example, my grandmother... Nearly cuts her finger off cutting the veggies, and she says, Oh, it's just cut. Put oh, the exactly. band aid on it. You know, when you fish it out of the salad bowl, <laughs> she goes, No, it won't hurt yeah, you. It's yeah, just oh, a it's finger. Just cut, Eat yeah. up, young man. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure this is a universal uh, phenomenon, Gail. I'm sure uh, around at Arnold Schwarzenegger's place, you'll often hear him going, Oh, paper cut. Yeah. Oh, I can't do any filming <laughs> yeah. today. Yeah, we've got to rest it all day and don't lean on it or anything. All right, thanks, Gail. That's a beauty. And now we're talking to Scott. What has Scott got to say, Scott? How are you guys? What Good. do you got for us? Um, you ever notice how guys always have to drive the car? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and what do you think the uh, explanation is? I don't know. I just remember as a little kid driving up the coast and 15 hours behind the wheel and it'd be, oh, I'm all right, I'm all right, and <laughs> mum would be in the passenger seat and yeah. they'd just be dad in that right-hand position. And why do you think it is? Do you think it's because mum didn't want to drive? Or Dad didn't want Mum to drive? Ah, uh, second, second option, guys. <laughs> second option. You know, Dad just wanted the wheel. And uh, that, of course, leaves Mum with the map-folding duties, which is probably good. And but... leaning over and slapping the kids. Right. And, and is it, uh, is it because, does it go back to cavemen times? Is it the hunter instinct? Is it, does it have to be there? Of course, yeah, men... It was always the men who drove the woolly mammoth. <laughs> it was always him at the ears. And, of course, men know where the next uh, drive through is. They've got that uh, surgically implanted in the brain. Yeah. Important. That's very important. Definitely. Okay, thanks, Scott. And we're talking to Paul now. Paul, what's your subtle diff? You notice how um, guys, uh, you, they buy their clothes and uh, they, they tend to wear them until they, they're, they're falling off. They're in shreds and stuff. And uh, yes. women can't be seen in public, you know, more than five times in the same outfit. Right, yes. That's right. Men will uh, survive a, a bomb blast and come out with a yeah. shredded pair of tracky decks and go, oh, there's still another good week in them. Right. <laughs> These will be back in style <laughs> any day now. And what are you wearing now, Paul? I've got some tracksuit pants with holes in them. Yeah, how long you had them? Oh, about two years. Well, what's, what colour are we talking? Royal blue with uh, three stripes? Nah, just just blue, mate. Oh, very nice. See, a couple more years in them, wouldn't it? Oh, about two more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Paul. You're a living example of your own formula. Mm. Now, finally, we've just got time to talk to Donna. Donna, what's your difference? Yes, it's something I'll never be able to understand, why men have to read in the toilet when they go for number two. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, well, not reading junk mail. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> a bit of reading material. And uh, what kind of reading material uh, gets used around at your place? Well, just the newspaper or, or whatever magazines are lying around. You know, I got I got through half of the Unabomber manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> I did, in one sitting. But yeah. I don't understand what you're waiting for. <laughs> I see. Uh, in, in, you know, inspiration, I suppose. Oh, uh, well, fair enough. Job by job, it builds into a fountain of knowledge. But that's how it works, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, is that our winner? That's a, that's obviously a beauty. But I don't know. We, we're sitting on a whole cachet of gold well, there. Uh, <laughs> the, I like them all time. So, you know. What about the, the, the wussiness, obviously? But I think the reading material of the toilet. <laughs> I think it's the best. The it's best. Okay, thanks, Donna. Thank you. you. Well, firstly, you got the tickets to see John Farnham. Oh. And you've got the Martin Malloy T-shirt. Even better. Yeah, very nice bit of acting. And, of course, you've got into the drawer for the uh, trip to the uh, Port Douglas treetops. Terrific. Who's that in the background? That's my bubba. And, uh, okay, you're going to take the bubba to the treetops if you come no out of the barrel? Way. Because no. we're just writing your name on a piece of paper now. It's going into the barrel. Our okay. assistant, Emma, is reaching in. And from the five gladiators who were successful this week, who's our winner, Em? Wayne Cook from Cessnock in New South Wales. was Wayne uh, involved with? Oh, he was the man who, uh, yesterday, wanted to see baby John Burgess providing a bit of rain delays play style entertainment at Wimbledon. Well, it's paid off for him, hasn't it? Okay, Wayne, well, you're heading to the Port Douglas treetop. Say hello to Dougie T for us. You'll be staying seven nights flying ANSET. And uh, sorry about you, Donna. You've still got the other prizes, though. Yep, terrific. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking part. And uh, time for you to go and change the reading material in the smallest room, I think, now. <laughs> Her husband's down the line. <laughs> As we speak, stocking up for the weekend. All right, thanks to everybody who took part in Radio Gladiators, and we'll be back in the next hour with, well, he's a bloke. I'm sure of that. He's Steve Bedwell. This is Martin Malloy.
brought to you by absolutely nobody. And in this hour of the freshly crimped Martin Malloy, we'll play Beat the Beasley. We'll encourage you to throw stuff away once again. And next up, we'll run a make on the week that was with the assistance of Steve Bedwell. Introduce our guest, and every three or four weeks, Mick and I get to sit back and let somebody else do the hard work. Join us as we get the events of the past week up on blocks and see if we can find out where the trouble started with the assistance of our Adelaide connection, Steve Bedwell. Hey, Steve, how are you? I very, you uh... very, very well, and you could sell. Yeah, yeah, not too bad, although we've just survived another Gladiators and I couldn't help but notice you were paying attention uh, quite closely. Differences between oh. men and women. Got any for us? Stuff? Yeah, Franklin Mint Plates. Yeah. Uh, women <laughs> just go crazy for your Franklin Mint Plate. <laughs> and I think Franklin Mint have worked this out. Because as I go to the latest plate catalogue, yeah. I go past your Anne Hathaway's cottage, yeah. your flowers. <laughs> I go past your film stars, your beautiful American Indian business. Yeah. I find myself at the back and I see the plate of uh, Coleridge's Dogs Playing Poker. Oh, it's now a, on a plate. <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> it's on a plate. And I've, I've rung up and ordered it today, yeah. right? And I've said to the woman, uh, get me an ace in the hole, which is actually that yeah. pitcher's proper title. And she's gone, you know, there'll be six in the series. And I said, just sign me up. <laughs> right. So you got the dog. What will be the others in the oh, series? You'll get your dogs playing snooker. No you, pool. Um, you'll get your dog, you know, uh, in the shed. You'll get your, your dog uh, making a bookcase. You get your skeleton sitting on the toilet. I imagine. <laughs> you'll get your dog walking up to the tennis net in a very short skirt and just showing one buttock and picking oh, up a ball. Very That's alluring. Very alluring. But what's going on? What's uh, really caught your well, attention? Uh, uh, well, Cliff at the tennis. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what's going on there? Uh, you know what I mean? Who is he kidding? If I dial out my hard-earned lolly to go and see tennis, that's what I want. Oh, yeah. Tennis. Not some washed-up old clack who, who, just because he's got a knighthood, reckons he can jump up and have a warble any time he feels like it. And this is what I reckon, sure, it starts yeah. with the rain delays. But mark my words, if we don't nip this in the bud now, next year he'll be banging out a couple of choruses of devil woman every time there's a change of end. <laughs> Stop him. From the central court umpire's position. <laughs> Up he'll the, be up in the chair the with seat. the microphone. Oh, yeah, he'll be there. <laughs> and you know what the sad part is? He got away with it because he's Sir Cliff Richard. Oh, yes. If yes. Lemmy from Motorhead had <laughs> tried that, he would have been handcuffed and in the back of a divvy van before he had the opportunity to get out the first line of Ace of Spades. <laughs> <laughs> They'd have just had him. And would Martina Navratilova be jumping in with a bit of air guitar? Uh, no way. So. Under no, maybe Andre Agassi, and that was the best you could expect. Now, who does Cliff think he is? Mm. You can bet your life he wouldn't be too happy if during a concert while he's off getting changed, John Newcomb decided to keep the crowd amused with a bit of totem tennis, <laughs> he wouldn't see big smiles on his face. You know, but having former stars of the host country it just start singing unprovoked during delays in play. Oh, dear. You know, it, what's going to happen with that? It, will it catch on? Oh, I reckon no. that I could probably cop Maurice Chevalier's rendition of Thank Heavens for Little Girls during interruption yeah. at Roland Garris. Mm. Sure. But I, for one, I'm happy to draw the line at Marty Rowan giving us a bit of denim and lace while we wait for the roof to shut at <laughs> oh. Flinders Park. It's just going to encourage them all, isn't it, oh. And then, while he's singing, some yeah. poor kitty is innocently mowed down while the covers are coming across now, the court. <laughs> is this true? You were telling us about it. I didn't see it on the news. What happened exactly? <laughs> well, they're unfortunately clad, as we know, the ball kitties at Wimbledon mm. in purple and green. It's right. the only place you can get away with that. <laughs> um, unless you play for Fremantle. Sure. And uh, I noticed that uh, they've, they've pulled the covers across mm -hmm. and he's fallen down and not been noticed. Uh, unconscious, <laughs> whacked on the head with a bit of wood. Right. And it's, it's come across and Cliff's singing and somebody's <laughs> gone oh, it's a bit of a lump in the covers. We better go tread that down. Oh! 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 And so they've uncovered it. He's come out and been carried off in a stretch of the, the little kitty. They've the, pulled him out. Yeah, they've, just, they've rescued him. If I was on the rescue team, before I pulled him out, I would have jumped under and giving him a quick Dutch oven. <laughs> <laughs> Just that subtle ripple going across Absolutely. the court. Absolutely. What was Sir Cliff doing during all this? Uh, living doll. He's just sitting along. <laughs> Got myself a knocked out sleepy, badly bruised and unconscious kitty. Was he just going on like that? Uh, just like that. <laughs> Except I nowhere see. near as relevant. <laughs> I see. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. uh, enough about Cliff, I think. Uh, well, he'd slept under there all night because he heard Cliff Richard was going to be singing. <laughs> and the weird, camped out. Uh, we, the weird part was somebody jumped out with a pair of scissors and saw it as the perfect template for a fish suit. <laughs> oh, of course they did. <laughs> now, what else have we been talking about on the show, Mickey? We had a bit of doggy news. Oh, we were talking to you about that dog, man. Nelson. Oh, Nelson the dog. The <laughs> runaway dog yeah, at the airport. Fantastic. Well, mm. tell me, if you're a dog 
and you've got this big expanse in front of you and your mm. cage pops open, you're not going to sit there and say, yeah, put me back in the cage, thanks. <laughs> no, that's, that's the green light. <laughs> your cage not. door open. See ya. <laughs> Chasing the hubcaps on the uh, concourse. Well, you're gonna, I know you're going to find this hard to believe because mm. it's normally such a clean sport, but there's been a bit of scandal in greyhound racing circles this hey, week. Hey, Has hey. there? Oh, when stewards, of course, and what a beautiful man your greyhound steward is. <laughs> you know, isn't that a job to aspire to? And uh, quite a fashion plate usually too. Mm. They become your steward when they're too mm. old to walk them, <laughs> <laughs> which is a fair age. <laughs> it took a urine sample from well-credentialed dish licker Hugh Blue. Oh, they yeah. got a bit more than they bargained oh, for. Did they? The sample in question was, of course, taken in April after a meeting at Singleton, of course, in the beautiful Hunter Valley up there, mm. uh, Newcastle Way, mm. the home of the dogs, yeah. uh, and tested at the Australian Jockey Club's high-tech PP analysis facility in Sydney. Now, Hugh Blue's sample was found to contain a volatile cocktail of, dr cocktail of drugs, enough to, in fact, to, quote, have the dog believing he was Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> <laughs> the drugs included the local anaesthetics protein and tetracaine, caffeine, amphetamines, and the recreational drug cocaine. Really? Now, do you think that an animal uh, which bites the water when you hose would have any concept of what a recreational drug is? <laughs> <laughs> Just amazing. The AJC also revealed that the sample was not Hugh Blues at all. It was human. Oh, no. Yes, human. <laughs> Somebody had swapped a sample of their own urine for a sample of the dogs. Now, how could you ever think you could possibly get away with that? And more importantly, what must they have actually given the poor Hugh Blue if when asked for a sample, the caffeine, amphetamine and cocaine using culprit decided that his urine was going to be cleaner than the dogs? <laughs> oh, what did they give with the dog? <laughs> what is the world coming to uh, when they're giving drugs to greyhounds? It sickens me, Mick. You're yeah, a big grey. You're a dog man. I'm you know a dog man from way back, mate. That's, <laughs> a, that's the weirdest. I think that's my dog. Whatever <laughs> happened to the good old days when if you wanted that bit extra from your dog, you'd simply load him into the starting box and just before he jumped, you'd dip your finger in a jar of hot English mustard and smear on his date. That's how you used to get him going. Those were the days. Oh, I miss those days. They streak past that rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> the loo is and long it, behind. I'll tell you what, and when another dog goes for a sniff post-race, they're in for a shot too. <laughs> <laughs> but switching urine with a dog, you know, I bet Scott Volkers wishes he'd have thought of that. <laughs> uh, the international hearing for Sam Riley could have been very, very different. <laughs> Ms. Riley, you have tested negative to banned substances enhancing uh, your performance. But, gee, uh, you'll be in real strife if you don't get yourself wormed soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the good news is, uh, Steve, I understand that dog is understudying for the lead role in Rocky Horror over in Perth at the moment. <laughs> so it's got a happy ending. Steve, can you stick around for another break? Uh, try and stop me. All right, that'll be next. I'm Martin Malloy. Malloy. Mm. Steve Bedwell is with us on the panel today. And there's been a bit more doggy talk during <laughs> oh, the break. Man. Look, can I, can I tell you something? There's, uh, have you seen... Uh, and this is related to the greyhound industry, trust me. There's a, there's a series of ads on TV at the moment for something called The Advisor. Oh, right yes. now, and it, I don't know if this is all states, but it's in about six chapters. There's six different ads. Yeah. And it all revolves around this one kind of enigmatic dead bloke yeah. who keeps turning up and looking uh, all wise all in right. the background while everyone goes about the business. But he is the same bloke who fronts the greyhound industry ad, <laughs> and you may have seen this in his, like, dustman's coat. He's this craggy old bastard, and he stands there going, OK, get along to the greyhounds, lads. You can win lots of good stuff. And he holds up this gold watch he's wearing. <laughs> yeah, the greyhounds. I'm thinking, yeah, well, there's the advisor's investment advice down the shit troop. What's all that about? <laughs> My have got the, the guy in the greyhound ad and gone, yeah, let's get him to front our full-on investment campaign. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. My, my grandfather's got photos uh, mm. uh, from Sydney when he was young of the greyhounds when they had monkey jockeys. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> he used to put monkeys on these dogs' back and a monkey just be hanging on like for grim death. Uh, and the really good part about it is just for like two minutes that horse gets to imagine it's a, uh, you know, dog gets to imagine it's a it's horse. A horse. Did I back that up? <laughs> Not at all. I ruined it anymore. Bring back the monkey jockeys, I say, but is, is that what's going on in Adelaide? Tell us what's happening uh, in Adelaide and indeed in South Australia that we need to know about. Steve. Adelaide's a place they are in desperate need of monkey jockeys yeah. because <laughs> shooting galleries could disappear from the Royal Adelaide oh, show because of the raging debate over... Have you touched on this? Yeah. Oh, we've mentioned it Do you briefly. want me to tear it up? <laughs> no, keep going. Uh, you know, uh, tell me if we're going down the same road because we got I can few, easily turn off and get a sandwich. We got a few <laughs> obvious gun lobby uh, comparison gags out of it, but... Uh, oh, but oh, well, in yeah. that case, uh, we could be in real strife. <laughs> uh, the show organises... They're concerned about whether the public, of course, will continue to accept
accept the galleries as family entertainment. Right, right, right. Now, your Adelaide show is like any other agricultural or horticultural show around the country for people who haven't been to it. And given that, I reckon that shooting galleries are there, you know, and their effect on the minds of kiddies are the least of their problems, oh, really. Yeah. There's a lot else yeah. going on, isn't there? Well, I pick on shooting galleries when the true merchants of evil are still allowed, nay, encouraged to peddle their destructive wear. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Oversized inflatable baseball bats. Oh, mm. And those plastic trumpets. It's been going mm. on for too oh, long. Man, those things and the family arguments they cause, they're responsible <laughs> for the deterioration of our social fabric. Not some kitty taking pot shots at lead ducks with a slug gun. <laughs> What's next? We'll ban the Dodgem cars in an attempt to lower the road top. <laughs> it's about as tenuous a link as you can get. And you can't tell me that squeezing off a few rounds at miniature metal mallards in an attempt to win a Spider-Man mask is going to cause as much mental anguish to your child as 15 minutes spent stumbling around blindly in the ghost train. <laughs> if you're really serious about tidying up the image of the royal show and weeding out the ne'er-do-wells, look no further than the statistics. Mm. I don't know of any infant who has ever suffered an injury as a result of their elder sibling spending a couple of bucks at the shooting gallery. No. But it, year in, year out, hundreds of toddlers, their faces grotesquely painted, needlessly choke on table tennis balls <laughs> as their desperately addicted older <laughs> brothers or sisters try to recreate the laughing clown <laughs> and what are people doing about it? Nothing. nothing. No marches. Just saying, get rid of the guns. Those shooting galleries. Oh. Yeah, that, those guns don't need to be crimped. They just need the barrels straightened. <laughs> Have you seen them? Yeah. Those barrels have got a mind of their own. Yeah. I didn't know whether I was using a shooting gallery gun or playing a trombone at one stage. <laughs> That's right. You can uh, <laughs> you Un uncurled. Uh, it was longer than one of those French horns. Yeah. You, you can fire a gun at the Royal Adelaide Show and hit a target at the Brisbane uh, Royal Show. I'm telling yeah. you. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, you know, every kid. You had a mini bike and a slug gun and you used to fire at each other going across the yard. It's just all what part of... In the bicycle helmets. There's some protection. Uh, you can't hurt yourself with a slug gun. Now, what else um, is happening, uh, Steve? Well, turning your toads, of course, is the call in South Australia at the moment. Uh, another cane toad was discovered there uh, yeah. less than a fortnight after one of the varmints was found at Victor. Sure. Uh, the cane toads are being brought to South Australia evidently as pets. Oh, no. you know, they'll sit, stay, spit the lot. <laughs> uh, by people returning from holidays in Queensland. So the state government has declared a one-month amnesty for people to turn in their toads. <laughs> you can take your toad to the nearest police station and hand it in and no questions will be asked. All, right. all collected toads will, of course, be destroyed. Uh, uh, but we all know amnesties don't work. You know, some people just aren't going to hand in their toads. And let's face it, if some madman wants to get his hands on an illegal toad, <laughs> he'll get it. Oh, yeah, he'll get oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the proposed uh, banning of all toads, of course, has met universal approval from the, we all know them, the anti-amphibian lobby. Yeah, and yeah, has yeah, this yeah. gun business, every time something's banned, haven't we all just, like, gone down the same road on whatever it is that needs to be banned? <laughs> so you're there. <laughs> uh, of course, they strongly support the toad buyback scheme yeah. as well as uh, crimping of all collectible and antique toads, etc., etc. You know, uh, toads don't kill flies, spiders kill flies, etc., etc. Something's banned. Let's go the gun lobby road. <laughs> now... <laughs> He's a, he's a, he's a, that guy I know drops a bit of comedy and provides his own critique at the same time. It's he really a classic. He bags himself. He's like Greg Norman as with was, his illegal ball. As I was going through that then, I thought, by jingos, anything that's banned, you know, uh, cream pies, balloon animals, a lot. There's going to be an, an anti-lobby and there's going to be an amnesty and there's going to be crimping. Eggs, that's right. Just enjoy it while you can, Steve. <laughs> it won't be there forever. No. Oh, no. And one final uh, topic. Well, to see a bit of a tidbit. Well... Uh, well, it's a sad piece, really. I found myself a, a bit hooked on gladiators. Oh, really? I love gladiators. And now Blade's broken a back. I don't know what I'm going to do. And yeah. I'm not proud of this, but I'm big enough to admit that I have a problem mm. uh, with the gladiators. It's happened. Well, you know how it goes. At the start, you're at a party. If someone puts on an old tape of almost anything goes. <laughs> Everyone's watching it, you know, so you sneak a peek yourself because you're convinced that you're strong. Yeah. You know, and sure, it's good, uh, but you can stop any time you want, right? Yeah. Uh, well, you can't. No, no. Uh, suddenly, almost anything goes isn't enough, and you move on to it's a knockout. Oh, not it's a knockout. And when you're in, and that's when the trouble really starts. Before you know it, your life's just a daze of Billy J. Smith and the wives of Rotarians playing their jokers. <laughs> Before you know it, you're under the hard stuff and gladiators. But yeah. enough of my problems. A couple of weeks ago, there was a male challenger on the show named Daniel. 
Oh, yeah. Now, it might sound outwardly, he seemed much the same as other male challengers, you know, uh, too much regard for the state of his own body, mm. overinflated opinion of his general importance in the scheme of things, mm. and uh, propensity for exaggeration as to the mental complexity of the tasks at hand. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but there was something very special about Daniel. What uh, made him stand well, out? Well, it's my opinion that Daniel may have taken the whole gladiator's experience a little too seriously. You see, in an effort to gain an advantage over his opposition, he virtually could Constructed a whole eliminator course in his own shed. <laughs> Travelator, cargo net, rope climb, balance beam, the lot. He'd even pulled apart his wife's old exercise bike and hung it from the roof to simulate the hand cycle. Daniel, mate, <laughs> you care a bit too much. <laughs> even scarier, though, than the thought of Daniel late at night alone in the dimly lit shed, tinkering away on his equipment clad only in an ill-fitting leotard, they told me I was mad style, yeah. was the reaction of my gladiator's viewing companion when Mike Hammond told us about Daniel's handiwork. With genuine concern for fair play, she asked, is that allowed? <laughs> <laughs> At first I laughed, you know, as you would, and I began to wonder, is it allowed? Is oh, this no. fair? Yeah, sure. What if this, admitting to practising at home, trend begins to invade other game shows? No one would have raised an eyebrow if a contestant on Supermarket Sweep was to admit they, you know, ducked down to Safeway once a week. <laughs> Dixie couldn't care less if someone on Family Feud fessed up to constant bickering with their brother. <laughs> So why should we care that Daniel erected a cross between a home gym and a bondage chamber in the privacy of his own shed? I'll tell you why. Because it's the thin edge of the wedge. That's why. Because before we know it, everyone will be doing it. People will be hocking their valuables to raise money to cobble up some crude chipboard recreation of the wheel from Wheel of Fortune in their spare room while they're getting starved. I think uh, baby John's got one going oh, in his man. place right now. Uh, mark my words, it's going to happen. Oh, yeah. It's happened before. Let's not kid ourselves. I don't think anyone will forget the run on cheap radio shack electrical parts and R2. D2 models as people <laughs> desperately tried to build perfect matches. Dexter at home. Oh, yes. No one's immune. You know, I've spent 10 grand on in-ground pool trying to win man oh man myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just as a matter of interest, Daniel lost. Oh, did he? Yeah, really? <laughs> that was the only joy in the whole thing. There's he a lost. moral to it. Yeah. So the bloke who just strolled up one. Seats never proper. proper. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that thing. Okay. Well, uh, Steve, if you're obsessed with gladiators, you've come to the right show. <laughs> because uh, we're talking uh, gladiators today because... It's time to play Beat the Beasley. Here's how it works. Mick and Tony have commissioned the nation's finest designers, engineers and craftsmen to construct several frighteningly lifelike replicas of federal opposition leader Kim Beasley. Every day on Martin Malloy, one of these enormous structures will be dropped onto something fragile, tiny or defenceless. That is, unless you can correctly answer five questions and beat the Beasley. If you're successful, you'll win a Sanyo Olympic Home Entertainment package, including a Sanyo widescreen TV, sports review VCR, enough pizza and coke to get you through the games, and a cleaner to come to your place and deal with the aftermath. Okay, lads, roll out the Beasley. Uh, yes, indeed, we'd be happy to do just that, Pete Smith. And Steve, I don't know if you've uh, seen this today, but there's been a celebrity <laughs> boating accident. <laughs> and... I shouldn't laugh. No, you shouldn't laugh, but it is bloody funny. <laughs> because uh, Tornado from the, uh, the Gladiators yeah. has driven his boat into America's Cup yachtsman Ian Murray. It's not funny at all. We shouldn't be laughing. Is he the, is he the bloke who sank one uh, off the coast yeah. of America? Yeah. yeah. And what's he done now? He I bailed the bloke yeah. on the Yarra. I don't think Tornado was involved in that mishap. No, what if you said there's an Australian Cup in... Yeah, oh yeah, no, it's Ian Murray. Kookaburra boy, Ian Murray. That's right. The Kookaburra boy. And he's been uh, knocked out by... Well, no, his uh, co-driver, Danny Demir, who is all right, you'll be pleased to hear. Mm. He was knocked out for 20 minutes by the pointy bit at the front of Tornado's boat. It's not often you can say I got hit in the head with a speedboat, but I'll be all right. No, it makes for a good story afterwards. I might have to lie down for a couple of days, but I'm expecting to be fine I'm after just that. i my head under a cold tap. Oh, don't worry about me. But the good news is we've secured the services of one Tornado. He's going to drive our Beasley today. Is he really? It's a speedboat-shaped Beasley uh, replica. And what are we going to drop it on, do, Mickey? Oh, uh, uh, well, let me have a think about it. What we might do is drop it on uh, Boris Yeltsin's liquor cabinet. Why not? How does that sound? It's as good a celebration uh, because of uh, Boris's victory as any that I've yeah. heard of. And, uh, Steve, I think uh, you probably don't want to stick around for this ugliness. I'm gone, gents. <laughs> Thanks for... Uh... Any, any senseless destruction of grog, and I can't stick around to hear that. <laughs> All right, it's not going to be pretty. And you can be involved, listeners. Just a few simple questions. We won't take up too much of your time. Call us now, 1-800-657-657. <laughs>
This is Martin Malloy. I can give you no authoritative information, either as to their nature, their origin, or their purposes here on Earth. It's time to beat the Beasley. Of course it is, here at Martin Malloy. Today we have constructed a Beasley, well, it's speedboat-like. Mm. It's still a proper Beasley, mm -hmm. but it's certainly speedboat-like, and naturally it's being driven by Tornado from the Gladiators, uh, engineer of a speedboat accident uh, just yesterday, I think. Mm. Uh, celebrity speedboat accident, yeah, of course. Absolutely. And we're going to drop it onto a Boris Yeltsin's liquor cabinet. It's a massive structure in itself. Mm. And uh, hanging in the balance is, of course, the Sanyo Olympic prize pack. Uh, we're talking widescreen telly. We're talking sports review VCR. Mm. We're talking po uh, pizza and coke. I was, it was coming out as one. As much there. as you want. It's poke. Let's just call it a big pack of poke. And they'll bloody come in and clean up afterwards. That's right. Heard. We've got a cleaner uh, waiting in the wings to take care of the mess. And uh, who's in line for this fabulous Sanyo prize, Mickey? It's uh, Len. How are you, Len? Great. And yourself? <laughs> Great. Seem pretty laid back, Matt. Um, <laughs> trying to be. It's Friday. You kicking back on the couch, are you? Uh, not quite. No. All right. Where about, say, you where are you calling us from, Len? From work? Uh, no, from home. Right, and what do you do for a job, Len? I'm a sparky electrician. Oh, right, okay. So mm -hmm. we, we might a be... A bright spark. We probably <laughs> need your services on this segment. There's been a few near fatalities during the week. <laughs> really? And yeah. we'll, we'll be calling you in if it goes wrong today. But you know how it works, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And the Beasley is right now being craned into position. We've got a few bloody simple questions for you. When you hear the gunshot, they'll be coming your Good way. Good luck, Len. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Fire it off. Oh! And who did Tim Fisher suggest had embarked on a series of vodka benders? Uh, Boris Yeltsin. Yes. Name two gladiators. Um, uh, Storm and um, Hammer. Yes. yes. Name one of Paula Yates and Bob Geldof's children. Um, Sky. Oh, pretty close. Uh, I'm afraid uh, not. Name a decent Australian sitcom. Uh, uh, there is one. Oh, um, I think that's, that's, that's the correct answer. Uh, name one of the bananas in pyjamas. B1. Yes. Name the other one. B2. Oh, hang on. Yeah, it's going to be a big one. You beat it. Did you think we made the questions easy enough today, Len? Um, oh, mate, they were pretty hard, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> From the VB state of mind at the moment, um, I just I think the VB helped. Oh, Hang on. Okay. there might have to be some drug testing. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I don't know if that's allowed. Then. We'll uh, be there was no drugs. We'll be needing. Legal one. We'll <laughs> take a sample anyway, just uh, for the record. Thanks, Lynn. And yes, you. I'll got... give you a sample of my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yes. What sort of dogs are we talking Hang on. about? We need a sparky. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know what's going on in here at the moment, Len. We're just uh, pressing buttons at random. You've probably done that yourself in your time. Um, I've tried, yeah. And uh, guess what? You've got the fabulous Olympic prize pack courtesy Sanyo. Thank you. And I'm sure our listeners at home would like to hear the uh, Beasley get dropped under Boris Yeltsin's liquor cabinet. Oh, for sure. Give us the go-ahead. Uh, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> A job well done. Thanks. Oh, we're getting a wash with vodka. <laughs> Don't worry, that'll come out in the wash. Thanks very Give much. Me one of those bendy Thank you. Hang ten. Thanks, Len. Thanks and we'll be lot. back with another week. In fact, the final week of Beat the Beasley from Monday on Martin Malloy. <laughs> I think Alanis Morissette has finished you learn and Martin Malloy has certainly finished for another week and uh, beat the... nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing at all. Mm. Len, uh, our winner on Beat the Beasley, I think we uh, successfully uh, managed to make the questions a bit easier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Check. <laughs> what Donatelli is... out the window. B1 and the other one would be... B2. Okay, you've got... Ah! That's when it went off. <laughs> All righty, and thanks uh, for everyone who's, who's helped us with Beat the Beast. And we're going to have one final week of it from Monday. And by the way, over the weekend, if you fancy a bit of internet-style fun, check out the Martin Malloy website. And uh, Pete Smith, uh, do, you, do you have the address for us? 
http colon slash slash martin malloy dot village dot com dot au oh, i'm sure you've mm. got that down now i'm sure yeah. people were writing it down quickly enough <laughs> and there's all sorts of uh, reading material daggy pictures and of course the martin malloy virtual chair to be mm. enjoyed but uh let's wind up the week as we always do by sure. packing full the martin malloy comedy and syncerator where we take all the really really weak gags we get them out of our system once and for all i'll kick things off start the clock gracie and following his overwhelming victory at the polls. Boris Yeltsin hasn't wasted any time getting back to work. Earlier today, the Russian president's position on nuclear disarmament was clarified, as was the Russian president. <laughs> Police and an ambulance crew were called yesterday to free a boy whose head was jammed between two brick walls at his home in Sydney's east. After their attempts to knock the wall down proved fruitless, the boy was eventually freed by a mallet-wielding Paula Yates. <laughs> A Californian car rental company reports, uh, and this is true, that amongst the items left by forgetful motorists in rental cars in the last year are nude photographs, sexy underwear, contraceptives, bondage gear, drugs and false body parts. And if Pamela and Tommy would like to collect the items, they're available at reception. <laughs> 11-year-old Monique Truong was being uh, praised last night after she passed a note under the door of a hotel room where she was being held hostage by a gang of kidnappers. Mm. Authorities believe it is the first note to be passed under a hotel door by an 11-year-old girl that wasn't addressed to members of Take That. <laughs> And finally, Mick, tragic news from the world of show business. After detecting a pungent smell, neighbours broke into the apartment of that little animated peanut butter Elvis from the TV commercial. But it was too late. Yes, though he'd uh, tried to keep it secret from his friends, he was in fact made from King Roy Peanuts. The uh, makers of the commercial say that Peanut Butter Elvis will be replaced by a more suitable character tentatively named Salmonella Fitzgerald. <laughs> and meanwhile, a shipment of Australian peanut butter bound for Iran was returned to port this week when jars were found to contain traces of Salmon Rushdie. <laughs> I think I've broken the insisterator. You've gone too far. I'm just trying to meet the criteria. And you did. Okay, well, that must be our cue to sign off. I think it is. And thanks to our guest today, Steve Bedwell, and, of course, all our gladiators, and uh, Len from Beat the Beasley. And we'd also like to thank uh, Boris Yeltsin for that very moving phone call earlier in the show. As always, a big end of week salute to our producer, Gracie. Thank you, Gracie. Our assistant, Emma. Emma. Making the sketches. It's Vicky. With you, Vic. All the button pushers, eggheads and satellite wranglers right around the network grid. You know who you are. And, of course, the big man in the glass booth, one Pete Smith. You, Pete. Now, uh, we'll be back Monday, and uh, what an eclectic lineup of guests we've got next week, Mickey. Iron Man Trevor Hendy will be with us. We'll have comedian Russell Gilbert and the architect of lateral thinking, Edward De Bono. Of course, he's hope, well overdue. Will he be sticking around for Beat the Beasley? I'm sure he will. I hope so. That'll Beat be... the De Bono. <laughs> of course. It's a new competition we're getting up, and uh, we'll leave you today with this important message. At last, you can take your old glasses and throw them away. Hi. That's right. Thanks to Martin Malloy, you can take those glasses and throw them away. Yeah? Yep. Simply throw them away. Okay. And don't just throw them away. Grind them into the floor. All right. Now what? You've thrown them away? Yeah. You've ground them into the floor? Yeah. Well, now you can thank the good folk at Martin Malloy. I see. What about those old records and cassettes? What about them? Now, thanks to Martin Malloy, you can just throw them away. Why? Go on, throw them away. What? Just dump them in the rubbish? That's right. And while you're there, take that rubbish and throw it away. It's already thrown away. Thanks to Martin Malloy. Wow. And what about that old couch? Throw it away? Throw it away. And is that a brand new stereo television and home entertainment unit? I don't know. I haven't got my glasses. Then simply throw it away. Okay. 
What about that old relative staying in the back room? Uncle Gordon. Now you can throw him away. What? All thanks to your good friends at Martin Malloy. Right. So, uh, what now? Sorry? Well, I've, uh... Thrown everything away. Well done. And remember, it's all yes, thanks... Yes, I know, but what am I supposed to do now? Um, had it written down here somewhere, but uh, seemed to have thrown it away. Yeah. Oh, for fuck... Just calm down. Have a seat on the couch. Oh, Sorry, geez. forgot. Oh, here it is. Now you can throw away those old glasses, records, cassettes, couch, TV, stereo and Uncle Gordon and replace them with the new Martin Malloy Glasso Recordo Couch O TV O Gordomatic 5000. The 12 in 1 stereo TV eyeglasses couch and irritating relative combination. Here, take it for a test, watch, sit, look, listen, play and agitate. Fantastic. I've never seen so clearly, sat so comfortably, enjoyed so much home entertainment choice and been shat so thoroughly before. Thanks, Martin Malloy. Martin Malloy, the future is here. Shall I send it in?